I just want to say how excited I am that we have this um, seminar today, which is um, highlighting the research on primates that are going on in Rwanda. Um, of course, there are other people doing research on primates in Rwanda, but we were excited to um, profile these three individuals who are working on their PhDs. And um, we're going to um, give them each um, some time to talk about their research. And um, I'm going to have each uh, speaker um, introduce themselves. And I think actually I'm gonna hand it over to Daniel because I don't know um, the order that he decided with the speakers. And I just wanna give a shout out to Daniel for doing such a great job at organizing um, the three speakers and thanks to the three speakers for taking your time today to join us. So Daniel, do you mind to um, uh, introduce in terms of the order that was decided for each of the three speakers? Yes, sure, thank you very much. Uh, we tried to, to, to put it this way, uh, Sylvain so will start and Axel will follow and then Dale. So without further ado, Sylvie so can go ahead. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sylvain Nyandwi. Uh, uh, I'm a PhD student at the George Washington University. So today I'm going to be talking about my research, which I think is very exciting for me, and I, I hope it's going to be exciting for you as well. So I don't want to talk much about my research because there's going to be a time designated for that. Uh, but for now, uh, this is what I can say, and then uh, I will talk about my research when it's time. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dogratias Twisingize. I work for the Dinosaur Geographer International Kariso Research Center as biodiversity program manager. I'm also a PhD student at the, at the University of Rwanda and I'm working on the conservation biology of the golden monkeys and the habitats in Rwanda. My main supervisor is Professor Beth Kaplan, but I have also other supervisors such as uh, Professor Damian Kayo and Dr. Winnie Eka. So uh, during this afternoon, I'll share with you a part of my PhD which is about feeding ecology and the reproductive pattern of other monkeys in the two forest islands in Rwanda. See you soon. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, is Axel able to talk to us for now? Hi. Um, sorry, I had a problem, an issue of internet. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, my name is Axel Kamanzi. I'm a Rwandan national and I'm doing my doctoral program at the George Washington University. Uh, yeah, I'm studying um, primate research, especially on feeding behavior. Sounds great. Thank you very much. So, uh, welcome everybody. So, I would like to tell the audience to keep your microphones muted and videos off while you can write down your questions and comments and direct them to the speakers after their presentations. Also, if anyone in the audience wants to give a talk in the future, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I can organize one for you. So I would like to invite our first speaker, Sylvie. The floor is yours, thank you. Hi everyone, so I am trying to share my screen. Could you allow me to share the screen, please? Okay, so, okay, can you see my slides well? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay, so hi everyone again. Uh, my name is Soveni Nyandi, uh, and I am a PhD student at the George Washington University. So today I'm going to be talking about my research project, which is about female chimpanzee behavior and reproduction in forest fragments in Rwanda. 
So here is the overview of what is going to be my presentation. Uh, ecological perturbation has been a major threat to uh, wildlife and one major source of this ecological ch uh, change is human uh, landscape use, which has led to the deforestation and fragmentation in over 50% of tropical and subtropical forests. Some of the causes of fragmentation and deforestation are uh, increased global wood markets, extension of agricultural activities, and extension of cities, which are taking a large portion of what used to be the forest. Due to this conservation crisis, 60% uh, of primate species are currently threatened by extinction, and 75% uh, of primate species are half populations that are declining in number. And uh, this is uh, mainly due to the fact that most primate species are forest uh, specialists. Basically, their life depends on the forest. One of the forms of habitat loss is fragmentation, which is defined as a breakup of a contiguous forest into smaller patches, a process uh, which has been associated with uh, the reduction of uh, food, res uh, food resources and also a restriction of movement of animals. Uh, one important behavior aspect that is uh, greatly affected by fragmentation is a dispersal behavior, which is defined as a permanent movement of individuals from their netto group into the new group uh, before their reproduction. So according to the existing uh, literature, uh, there are some factors that have been shown to favor dispersal, and this includes, for example, in breeding avoidance, where individuals uh, tend to leave their natal groups as a way to avoid uh, mating with their close relatives. Individuals might also be motivated to leave their natal groups as a way to avoid keen competition. Uh, individuals may also feel motivated to leave their natal groups as a way to seek uh, for a high quality foraging area. Basically by leaving their groups or their area, they, it's more likely to find a new variety of food resources in uh, the communities that they are joining. Uh, so we talked about factors favoring this pressure, but we also need to keep in mind that uh, there are some costs associated with this behavior. These include, for example, ranging in unfamiliar area, exposure to predation, exposure to uh, novel pathogens, and also, and also this can lead to uh, increased aggression from conspecific. Yeah, sorry, uh, sorry about that. I was talking about some uh, costs associated with dispersal, and the last uh, cause of dispersal is increased uh, aggression from conspecific, especially when uh, in the groups or the communities that animal, the dispersing animals are joining. Uh, keeping in mind the consequences of fragmentation, habitat fragmentation and isolation can magnify uh, the risk associated with dispersal. And indeed, inter patch distance is a key factor determining dispersal probability and success. Dispersal behavior is critical for population viability because if there is no dispersal, there is no gene flow. Uh, which can lead to inbreeding depression. Fragmentation can also affect uh, grouping behavior. So we've seen in the previous slides that fragmentation can cause the loss of key food resources in the habitat, which is also more likely to affect or to increase intra-group feeding competition. So in trying to, to increase foraging efficiency and minimize feeding competition individual, individuals uh, might decide to adjust their subgroup size. Uh, a social organization that is known as fish and fusion uh, uh, communities. So basically in fish and fusion communities, uh, subgroup change regularly in size and composition throughout the day or throughout days. For example, you might have uh, 10 individuals ranging today, together in day one, and then in day two, they split up into two subgroups. And on day three, the two subgroups might change in group composition. So interestingly, some studies have shown that uh, this behavior flexibility might help some of the species uh, to offset 
some of the consequences of fragmentation. So one most common primates or most common uh, fish and fission species uh, is chimpanzees. Therefore, uh, the purpose of my research project is about uh, to, uh, to assess how fragmentation and food availability affect female chimpanzee behavior and reproduction. So my study will integrate uh, behavior, genetic and ecological data to test how fragmentation relates to female behavior flexibility in terms of subgrouping patterns and dispersal behavior. Uh, I will also use integrate this data set to assess how fragmentation impact female reproductive performance. So here are my study sites. Uh, I just want to let you know that uh, my study will uh, take advantage of two forest fragments in Rwanda, which are similar in chimpanzee population density, but which differ in terms of uh, food availability and their proximity to the larger population of chimpanzees in Nyongwe National Park. So this constitutes a powerful natural experimental design, especially because most previous studies uh, on fragmentation have focused on uh, fragments in which there is already been the loss of most key food resources, uh, which limits our ability to test these two factors independently. So these uh, projects uh, give us an opportunity to test uh, these two factors independently. So uh, the main, I mean, uh, the my first research aim will be to examine how habitat fragmentation relates to female behavior of flexibility in terms of subgrouping patterns. So the main questions here are how is this affected by fragmentation or C and food availability? So can fission fusion uh, dynamics help to offset the feeding competition and in, uh, inbreeding risk? So all of these are the questions that are basically going to be answered uh, throughout my study. Uh, based on what is currently known, my hypothesis is that uh, fish and fusion dynamics is impacted by fragmentation and food availability. So if fragmentation alone is the main driver, I would expect the same response in both forest fragments. So in this case, my prediction is uh, are that in both fragments, subgroups are more cohesive or larger because it is known that chimpanzees in fragments might behave as if they are ranging in risky area. And the subgroups might even become much larger when individuals are ranging outside of the forest. If, fragment, if uh, food availability alone is the main uh, driver, I would expect to see differences between these two forest fragments since they are also different in food availability. So based on the known positive relationship between uh, food availability and subgroup size, I predict that subgroups in Gishwati will be smaller and female will spend more time in human modified landscapes. So for the behavior data collection, uh, the behavior data is being collected uh, through full day group follows during which we are recording the data on social and feeding behavior uh group composition number of estrus females and the location etc and uh, in terms of ecological data we are conducting a monthly phenology in these two forest fragments uh, where we are surveying a uh, designated number of trees in each of these forest fragments so my research aim too will be to test how isolation and uh, isolation relates to female behavior flexibility in terms of dispersion. Uh, based on what is known, my hypothesis is that uh, dispersion is affected by isolation distance. So if isolation alone is the main driver, I would expect to see differences uh, between these two forest fragments uh, due to uh, the long distance uh, separating Ishwati from uh, the other two populations, I would expect or predict little to no gene flow. I also predict that adult females will range with male relatives in Ishwati. So in Chamdongo, I predict that there is uh, more gene flow due to its proximity to Nyungwe National Park assuming that there is a disparity between these two populations. Uh, in, in order to test these predictions, I will use genetic data uh, generated from non-invasively collected fecal samples 
And I just want to let you know that I already completed the phase of uh, the sample collection and uh, my, the samples are being uh, analyzed in the lab. Uh, my third research aim, which is the last one, uh, it will be to test how habitat fragmentation impacts female reproductive performance, which I think is going to be a long-term goal since it requires a long time to get enough data needed for this. Based on what is known, I hypothesize that uh, female reproductive performance is affected uh, by food availability and fragmentation. So if fragmentation alone is the main driver, I would expect to see the same in both forest fragments since the both forests are fragmented. So under this assumption, I predict that both fragments will have high female cleaning infant ratio, which means uh, we will have more females, but with fewer clinging infants, which is a bad sign. I also predict that females in forest fragments will have lower energy balance. If uh, food availability is the main driver, I would expect to see differences between both forest fragments, since of course they are different in terms of food availability. So in this case, I predict a, a high female clinging infant ratio and a lower energy balance in Gishwati than Changdongo population. Uh, to test uh, these predictions, I will use two metric. Uh, the first metrics, the first metric uh, will be adult female clinging infant ratio, and the second metric will be C peptide levels, uh, which will be measured from non-invasively collected urine samples. So this will be uh, collected. Uh, in the next few months. So as an intellectual merit, uh, this study has the potential to test how fragmentation affects population independent of food loss. So this study will also reveal the extent to which uh, fish and fusion dynamics can offset negative uh, consequences of fragmentation. So and then lastly, this study will also complement other studies investigating variation in MHC and gut microbiome in these two forest fragments. So here are my acknowledgements and then I will be happy to take questions and comments when it's time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Silva. Um, I would like to remind this, the audience to write down their questions. So after all presenters have finished, people will be free to ask questions or give comments. So right now, let's hear from Axel. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, let me try to share the, my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. OK. Yeah, as I said during my introduction, I'm doing my doctoral program at the George Washington University, where um, for my research, which I'm going to talk about now, my dissertation research is about um, the development of feeding behavior in the population of Virunga Mountain gorillas. So my research interests are in primate feeding ecology, nutrition, and their conservation. And this field of study is really important or vital to understanding some questions um, in primate behavior because it helps us to understand how the environment uh, affect this population, either being their behavior, um, life history, or population dynamics, and the, how they re react in, in return. So understanding the ecological factors that affect these primate populations, um, it's necessary for conservation and management of these primate populations. So according to the primate socio-ecological model, um, this theory uh, posits that the ecological factors um, influence these primate, uh, the social organization of these populations. Uh, but by their being in group, there are some, of course, benefits, but also some costs. One of the benefits uh, is that they have access to food resources, but that also be as a cost. They compete for food resources. So uh, these competitive uh, interactions may be intensified by some ecological factors. 
For example, the way the food resources are distributed in the landscape or the food abundance, uh, food availability, and even the quality of these food resources. If you look on this, on this side, uh, this stands for the primate folivore, and researchers have assumed, it has been assumed that primate folivore are less ecologically constrained because they are known to rely on foods that are available all year round, and even dispersed, uh, as I illustrated here, um, the, the food resources are dispersed in, their lands, in the landscape, unlike uh, their counterparts, frugivores and insectivores, which have food that are more patchy and which can lead to being more, more monopolized. But in the case of front primate folivores, depending on the nature of their food resources, there has been that assumption that they are less, um, less constrained. Uh, but recent findings have in, actually indicated that primate folivore are in fact subject to dietary challenges um, because some evidence have indicated that they are experiencing ecological variation. For example, there are some evidence that indicated that the, their food resources, uh, there is variation in the way food are distributed in their habitat. And um, even the quality of food, there, there is variation in the quality of the food, which um, is associated to primate folivore concentrating their feeding on some key food uh, species. And that lead um, because they have inequal access to food resources, which have variation in their quality, there is also inequality in energy gain. Um, but most primate studies have been focused, like primate, the studies focusing on primate folivore, they have been focused on adults, but we know little on, on the impact of these dietary constraints during the immaturity. And this is the critical period worth investigating because it has an influence on primate um, survival. Uh, and there are a number of reasons to believe or to make me focus on the juveniles is that when comparing to other mammals, primates have a long, relatively long juvenile period. And that's the time when they they are no longer relying, nutritionally relying to their mothers, but they are being independent foragers. They are acquiring foods by their own. And during that time, they are learning. They haven't achieved the foraging competence of adults. So they are still learning foraging skills, but at the same time, they have high energetic demands for, invest, for sustaining body growth and brain maturation. So in the past, in the journey of developing that juvenile foraging competence, they have challenges. They may be constrained by the time needed to learn those technical skills because there are some foods that will require them to know how, where, and how to process the food. And also, given their small body size, uh, they haven't attained it adult like physical abilities. So they may they need time to acquire that physical abilities of adults. And also being in group, they are experiencing effects of feeding competition um, with older individuals. So when there is reduced foraging competence, there are, there are consequences for juvenile development and their behavioral maturation. So this brings me to, uh, that was a background gives me like the main goal of my study is to investigate the factors that affect the their de dietary development which has consequences for the physical and behavioral development so i'm um, investigating this question in the virunga mountain gorillas for a number of reasons first uh, as i'm looking at primate folivore gorilla uh, the virunga mountain gorillas are even for of all gorillas, they are the highly folivorous, but even among all apes, they are highly folivorous and they occupy the highest elevation, even close to 4,000 meters of elevation. And when looking on the, in their habitat, 
habitat. Their habitats are characterized by look on this map. You can see those different colors represent different vegetation zones, and you can see there there is um, habitat heterogeneity. Um, but one thing I need to mention is that um, most feeding ecology studies uh, in this population come from the area, um, from the habitat where gorillas are ha that, that are monitored by Karisok Research Center uh, ranging. So other habitats, so in this talk, I will be referring to that habitat like as Karisok study area. So the, we know little from the other habitat zone outside of Karisok study area. And, and there are recent evidence indicating that have indicated um, changes in ranging behavior. Uh, and beside that, um, that within uh, the Karisoke area, but within the whole park, of course, there has been an uh, increase, increase in population size, but there is variation in population growth rate. And another thing is that there is, the way food resources, plant food species are distributed uh, in the land, in those habitats differ. So, but we don't know what is are the roots of those changes or uh, that kind of variation. So there is a need to know um, the impact, the imp to understand the uh, understanding the impact of ecological variation on the feeding development development of immature gorillas would help us to to have um, to know what is at the root of these changes. For my study, I have three objectives, and the first one is to explore the spatial nutritional uh, variability within the park. And the second one is to look at what they are eating and how they are eating those food resources, how they are processing the food. And lastly, uh, my third objective is to look on the impact of feeding competition on the development of feeding behavior in this population. For my first objective, as I was saying, most studies about nutritional ecology in this population come from the air the habitats uh, where gorillas monitored by Karisoke are ranging. And um, even from those studies, um, there is no consideration of altitude because as you I just showed you on the other map, there is a wide range of altitude. And the same plant food species may vary in their nutritional profile with altitude so um but so for this I i'm planning i already collected plant samples from uh Visoke mount and i consider the altitude i collected at each altitude but also i'm planning to collect plant samples in this area where i circled a i refer to it as rdb area and um, to compare the those nutritional data set given that ecological variation that I just talked about. So for my second objective, which is looking on the diet composition, that means what they are eating and foraging competence, uh, how they process those foods. Um, yes, there have been some um, studies conducted. Um, there's an early study by Watts that looked on the feeding development in this population but he found some variation with individuals so there is we don't know yet what is the what is driving that variation and so looking at the foraging competence uh, would also help us to to see what is driving that variation and i will test to test that um my hypothesis because i hypothesize that um the the immatures will we acquire foraging uh, competence with age and even the dead composition as they mature. So I will use the feeding data uh, because of the time, I will not go more in detail into that. And my third, ob my third objective, uh, which is looking on the impact of feeding competition on the development of feeding behavior in this population, uh, you would ask yourself why if, because there is an assumption that uh, Virgo Mountain Gorillas have, yes, it's an, an evidence, there have been an evidence that they have weak feeding competition, but there are other recent findings that do suggest that they in fact are subject to feeding competition. Um, they, I think they, it's, 
a finding by Gruta that shows that group size, the group size effect on the foraging efficiency in this population, and also what has indicated that um, there are higher rates of aggression then during feeding uh, compared to the other um, context. So it would be interesting to look how immature individuals are affected by feeding competition in this population. Um, so as a wrap up, this study has relevance to conservation because it will shed light to those what is um, driving those changes that I talked earlier, um, changes in emerging behavior or even that variation population growth rate within the park. And also there is a program of expanding the, the park. Uh, this study would contribute to, the, to, the, to, that, to that program and uh, um, provide insight into the forest food of focus in, during the expansion of the park. So uh, I think that university and the Kashpi program I'm engaged with, and I appreciate the Diana Fosigora Fund for because I work closely with them during my research. Thank you. Great, that was interesting. Thank you very much, so, uh For now, let's hear from Gail. I can see your screen is can up. You see my screen? Yes. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Uh, once again, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Deo, and uh, as I said before, I work as a, a biodiversity program manager at the Dan Fosse Gorafa International Karisoka Research Center. I'm also a PhD student at the University of Rwanda, and I'm working on the conservation ecology of Godremakis and the habitats in Rwanda. Today, I'd like to share with you a part of my PhD, and uh, we'll be sharing findings on feeding ecology and reproductive patterns in Godremakis in the two forest islands of Rwanda. As you may know, land cover and land use changes linked to anthropogenic activities are major threats to biodiversity, uh, especially in the tropical forests, where deforestation and habitat degradation reduce suitable habitat and for degradation, therefore forcing species through behavioral changes. However, some species such as habitat specialists and endemic species are particularly vulnerable to those changes. For example, uh, species or Cercoptecus monkeys are monkeys that live in Africa, especially in the central parts of Africa and southern east part of Africa. Uh, and uh, are only 20 species. Uh, blue monkeys is one of Gwenons. These species occupy the central part of Africa, and it is the most white Gwenon in Africa, uh, in the in Gwenons. Uh, Blue monkeys uh, are in the 16 subspecies, and uh, eight of them are threatened by habitat loss. Burden monkey is one of the blue monkey subspecies. This subspecies is only found in two forest fragments, uh, including the Virunga Massif, where golden monkeys are found mainly in the bamboo zone. The second and only habitat of the golden monkey is the Gishpati Mukura National Park. Those two forest islands were once connected before 1958. 
and they were disconnected due to human activities through habitat loss and fragmentations. Uh, furthermore, the Volcanoes National Park, part of the Virunga Massif, went through further uh, civil habitat uh, change, uh, where uh, these forests lost more than 50% of its original size. On the other side, the Gishpati forest lost more than 98% of original size between uh, 1980s and the 1990s. In order to more understand how the golden monkey copes with ongoing changes in the habitat, we had two uh, research questions. Uh, the first one was to know the key diet and key food resources for golden markets and to know whether there is a relationship between availability of food resources and base seasonality. We have started three different groups, including two groups in the Volcanoes National Park. And those groups are Group K and Group A. Uh, those two groups uh, live in the, the bamboo zone, while the third group, which is Group G, is located in a Fromontane forest of Ishkwati Mukura National Park. We have collected the diet and the demographic data over 24 consecutive months, starting January 2017. We also collected the data on the feeding patterns in all uh, three studied groups. We uh, collected data related to demographic information, such as uh, mating and the birth events. We acquired further additional data uh, from the Daniel Fossil Graph International, especially uh, data collected between 2005 and 2016 in groups ranged in the Volcanoes National Park. We have also collected phenological data and we focused on seasonal key food plant species, uh, which is bamboo in the Volcanoes National Park and fruiting trees in the Gishpati Forest. Uh, in the Volcanoes National Park, we have used a 16 square meter plots and we had a total of 28 plots in the study area uh, where we had 15 plots in the group K and the 13 plots in group M, that's in their home range. And uh, we had uh, selected a total of 82 individual fruiting trees, uh, which composed of the most six important species eaten by golden markets in the party. Uh, data were recorded at the two week intervals. Uh, for example, in the, the Volcano National Park, we recorded number of bamboo shoots in the plots. We measured and marked each uh, individual bamboo shoots during each uh, visiting period. In Gishwati, Mukura National Park, we have estimated the percentage of crown occupied by fruits in order to know uh, how much fruits we have in those uh, fruiting trees that we've been monitoring over 24 months of the collection. For data analysis, we mainly employed uh, our vision and we have summarized our feeding data uh, by food types, food plants, and we also summarized our daily feeding data by averaging uh, a feeding codes by month, and we ran the correlation in order to correlation analysis in order to investigate the relationship between uh, key food availability and the key food consumption, and also we have uh, uh, tested the correlation between birth events, native frequencies, and the key food availability. And we also uh, run uh, correlation analysis in order 
based on effectiveness, methane frequencies, uh, and key food consumption. As a result, uh, the Gone Monkey in the Volcano National Park mainly feed on uh, tree leaves, bamboo leaves, and the bamboo shoots. On the other, on the other side, in the Gishwati Okura National Park, the dirt for the Golden Monkey were composed of uh, fruits and leaves. And here uh, on this table, uh, I wanted to point out that group K fed on uh, leaves up to 73% of the total of feeding in goods, while at group M, the Golden Monkey fed on up to 87% uh, of feeding records in terms of leaves. Uh, and here, the Gishwati, the group K, the group G, or group located in the Gishwati Mokwa National Park, this group uh, spent much time, uh, 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 a total of 48% uh, feeding on fruits. This slide shown seasonal variation in the consumption of food plant item. And uh, here we present average percentage of feeding records. At the first row is about group K. The second row uh, is about group M. The third row is about group G. And this square, this red square highlights um, uh, seasonal variation in the key food plant item where group K mainly fed on bamboo shoots between uh, September and, Nove and November, while group M fed on bamboo shoots between uh, March and May. And in the Gishwati group, um, fruits were consumed, consumed throughout the year but with a peak between uh, uh, March and May. This slide shown key food availability and consumption. And we have uh, compared, we have correlated average percentage of feeding reports and the percentage of trees with the fruits and the number of bamboo shoots per square meter. Uh, in general, key food availability correlated with key food consumption in all standard groups. Uh, this slide shown mating frequencies in the standard groups, and uh, the average mating frequencies per hour uh, in general in all standard groups, uh, golden monkey copulated or just mate. Uh, throughout the year, but with certain peaks, for example, in a group M is the, the first row, uh, we had uh, a highest record in the average mating frequencies between uh, October and December, while in a group K, a, a highest mating records were uh, taken between March and May. In the Gish party, the highest mating record was uh, corrected in October. This slide shown monthly average distribution events, uh, average distribution of birth events in the group M, K, and G. And uh, here, what is interesting is just uh, Golden Monkey had specific birthing period. We are uh, group M, the first row, Golden Monkey gave Fs between January and April, while the group K, the second row, the Golden Monkeys had newborns between August and November and December, while the group G, Golden Monkeys had newborns between March and May. Uh, in general, 
meeting events declined with increasing key food plant key food plant item availability means bamboo shoots in the uh, group K and also uh, with the, the meeting events declined with increasing key food plant availability key food uh, plant item availability in the uh, group G. Uh, in terms of births, um, birth events increased with uh, key food plant item availability in the group uh, K, and also births increased with uh, key food. Here uh, I was talking about the relationships between food availability and the reproductive events. We are uh, meeting events declined with uh, key food availability in a group K of Volcanoes National Park and in a group G in the Degeshkwati Mukura National Park. Why meeting decline with increasing uh, bamboo shoots availability? On the other side, birth events increased with increasing bamboo shoots availability in group K and uh, birth events increased with increasing fruits availability in group G. On the relationship between food consumption and the reproductive events, uh, birth events increased with increasing bamboo shoots consumption in a group K, uh, while in a group G, beef events also increased with increasing fruits consumption. As a conclusion, for the markets fed on the diversity of food plant species, and also feed on some animal resources, such as caterpillars, insects, and uh, some reptiles. This dietary flexibility allowed the golden monkeys in both standard population to adapt to available food resources. Uh, for example, the Volcanoes National Park population uh, is more frivolous, I mean, it's spending much time feeding on leaves, while the Gishwati population is frugivorous, therefore spent much time feeding on leaves, on the fruits. The timing of birth, birthing and mating differed between standard population, the Gishwati population and the VNP population but also uh, the mating and the bathing events differed within this VNP study population. And this goes alongside the uh, uh, variation in availability of key food species as also the consumption of the key food species, means uh, uh, bamboo shoots in the Virunga massive and the uh, fruits in the Gishkwati Mokura National Park. Both populations are seasonal breeders with distinct mating and bathing seasons. And uh, we can uh, describe golden monkeys as a uh, classic or Inca breeders, uh, means that they give births prior to the availability of key food species, which would provide uh, energy for uh, doing the lactation of the, uh, the new born. Uh, given that uh, golden monkey production goes alongside availability of key food, key food resources, uh, there is a current study that mentioned uh, impact of climatic change on 
bamboo regeneration. And also, as you may know, uh, there is a effect of on the climate change on the fruits uh, regeneration, on fruits availability. Therefore, we recommend to continue monitoring uh, in the changes of key food species, key food plant species for uh, golden monkeys in order to more understand uh, future and long-term survival of a golden monkey species. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dale. That was interesting. And thanks to the audience to stick up with us. So for now, it's time for a questions and comments session. Uh, we have a few questions in the chat, but I would like to ask people to ask directly. You can unmute yourself and ask and you can mention someone you need to answer your question. So the floor is yours, audience. I can start from a question in the chat from Jean-Paul, who said, this is very interesting deal. I'm curious to understand the difference in mating and birthing periods between the three groups of the same species. So Deo, you may answer your question. Yeah, uh, thanks so much. As I said, uh, golden monkeys have specific bathing period with the Burkina's National Park population having a newborn uh, during the availability of bamboo shoots. In the Gishwati group, the golden monkey gives birth during the availability of fruits. And uh, um, based on our data, we found out that there is a peak in the uh, mating, which occurred six months prior to the first newborn. Therefore, we can say that the golden monkey uh, uh, times or just adjust their uh, Bathing period, time to give newborn during uh, prior to the availability of key food resources. In other words, uh, the golden monkeys of the Volcanoes National Park give birth during the availability of bamboo shoots because bamboo shoots are key uh, food resources to help monkeys during the lactation. And this is the same in the English party population where fruits provide key resources during the adaptation for a newborn in the good markets. Maybe I don't know if the, if this provides more clarification to the question I was asking. All right. Thank you. I hope Jean-Paul will let us know if this sounds good. And we also have a question for you from Aloisi, who says, uh, you are talking about types of food more preferable by golden monkeys. Among those food types, which, which kind of nutrients or food substances are necessary for their life and which can stimulate them to consume such food? Uh, thank you. Second uh, questions I asked to, to suggest a further recommendations. Uh, yes. Thank you, Deo, for, for, for answering the question. As you started in the introduction, you said that uh, you demonstrated that uh, the Volcanoes National Park and Gishwati Mokura National Park were, were connected before and uh, you started to the same species of, of, of golden monkey and then as uh, the findings uh, showed that uh, there was change in the uh, uh, behavior in, in, uh, in the reproductive behavior of the same species along the year. I would like to, to know 
or to get more clarification from the expert from here, if maybe along the years, we, should, we can predict changes in the same species, maybe we, are, we attend to a certain varieties, we adapt according to the, the change in the habitat and the fragmentation. What do you think uh, as you have been studying the Well, um, yeah, just to provide the more clarification to your question. Uh, back in 1958, both of the Virunga Massif and the Gishwati Forest were connected. Uh, they were disconnected between 58 uh, and 1973. And uh, as you may know, the uh, Virunga Massif area uh, is more is uh, composed with the uh, um, non fruiting trees so species living uh, in that area uh, those uh, are herbivorous or species that feed on the plants uh, have adapted to feed on leaves uh, while the Kishkwati forest is dominated with a from montane forest, from montane forest, and this forest is dominated with fruiting trees. So uh, some species living in that area, uh, uh, such as golden monkeys, mostly feed on, feed, feed on fruits. And uh, um, coming back to the uh, Volcanoes National Park, uh, we said that golden monkey lives in the bamboo zone. And the bamboo is a chief food species and the chief habitat for the golden monkeys. And uh, golden, we found out that golden monkey uh, has uh, a bathing season, or they have newborns during the bamboo shoots period. Bamboo shoots regenerate during the rainy seasons, that's between March and May, uh, or and between September and November. What is interesting is that in the Volcanoes National Park, golden monkey uh, gives birth prior or during the bamboo shoots availability. So that was uh, the interesting uh, finding we had. And in the Gishwati, uh, given that there is no bamboo, just there is a bamboo, but just uh, some stands of bamboo, the group we studied uh, ranged in the fruiting trees uh, habitat, and we found out that uh, that group uh, had newborns during the uh, availability of fruit uh, of fruits. So uh, we we've been just uh, highlighting uh, same species living in different habitats and timing they are a productive pattern during the availability of those two specific key food species. And they are, are still on this topic. I'd like to mention that only bamboo shoots and fruits are seasonal food species for the, for the world markets. Thank you. I don't know if I, I was clear. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Dio. Yeah, uh, uh, talking about, uh, there was a question by Aloisi, right? Yes. Yeah, she was asking about uh, content of key food for God, for God and Marcus, right? Yes, and she's on the chat. She will be able to clarify if possible. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to uh, just mention that bamboo shoots has is rich in protein, and as you may know, protein is really important during lactation. Uh, on the other side, in, uh, I talk about bamboo also. Uh, it is rich in energy, uh, 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 carbohydrates, and uh, uh, fruits. As you may know, fruits are also rich in carbohydrates. So uh, those uh, uh, contents 
uh, are really important during lactation. Maybe that's why monkey need to uh, time the bathing period during the availability of those foods, uh, food species which are rich in uh, protein and carbohydrates in order to help them uh, during the lactation period. Thank you. I don't know if uh, uh, RZ is, uh, needs more clarification. If so, please let me know. RZ, does that sound good to you? If not, you can ask. Hello? Yes. Thank you very much. I'm way satisfied to my question. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. I would like to remind the audience that we have had other two speakers, so you are free to ask them as well the questions. And we have two minutes left for our talk. So we can have one one more question before we close our session. Anyone with a question or a comment? Okay, apparently we are all satisfied and this brings me to the closing remarks of this talk. Thank you very much to all our speakers, Axel, Sylvain, and Do. This is really interesting research, and we appreciate your time to talk to us. And for the audience, please reach out if you need to talk into one of these seminar series. Thank you very much, and we hope to see you next Wednesday. Thank you to Daniel and Dr. Kaplan for, for organizing this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye.